lunch and our marketing. I'd like to bring your attention to the noon time hour when we begin. I'm Dee Davy and I'm filling in for Derek Marabon in hosting today's session. Just a show of hands, how many people are here for the first time? Welcome. Welcome to Lunch Ann Arbor Marketing. We run the program every Wednesday, 11.45 to 1, and we do finish on time dead on 1. For those of you who haven't joined us before, the program runs through just brief introductions. We have our guest speaker talk about the topic of the week. That's followed by question and answers. And then you have a chance to take the mic in your hands and introduce yourself, your business, and if you have an ask that you're looking for. Today's speaker is someone that I'm sure you're going to really enjoy listening to. Webinars are becoming one of the key parts of all of our marketing mix. And it's my pleasure to introduce Linda Detterman, who is the marketing director for the Interuniversity Consortium for Political and Social Research, and I have to say that very, very slowly, <laughs> for the University of Michigan. So um, we will listen to Linda in just one moment. We are a nonprofit organization. We don't ask for a registration fee or a membership fee, but we do ask for donations. A suggested donation is $3, but that's entirely up to you. And Stacy Halleck from Dollar Bill Cupping will pass the hat, and we will now get on with the show. So Linda, welcome to Lunch and Arbor Marketing. A round of applause for Linda as she joins us. See how loud I should speak. Can you, can you all hear me in the back? Good? All right. So um, I was a little bit worried that um, after last week's uh, really great attendance standing room only that there wouldn't be anyone here, so thank you for coming. Um, as uh, as uh, Dee said, I work for ICPSR and I rarely attempt to say the name and often because I have switched up a lot, but um, we're a unit of um, the Institute for Social Research at U of M. Um, so there are a few of me and uh, about 100 other people, 100 of my colleagues that can say that we work at ICPSR, within ISR, at the U of M. <laughs> so um, we are a little bit different than most uh, academic units, uh, if you will. Um, we are a subscription-based entity, uh, at least 25% of our businesses. We're about 15 million. In, in size, we operate largely like a nonprofit within the University of Michigan. And I say that because um, University of Mich Michigan actually pays us a fee to subscribe to our collection so that um, uh, researchers, students, uh, whomever wants to access our collections um, can do so uh, freely. Um, the other portion of our business, that's about $3 million, but the other portion consists of grants and contracts. Um, I'll, I'll talk about exactly what we provide uh, momentarily because I um, don't want to bore you and I also want to put it in the context of, um, of why we do webinars. So um, just, just briefly what we're going to do is uh, talk about whether it makes sense um, uh, to, to webcast and I use web, webcast and webinar uh, interchangeably so forgive me if, if, uh, if I start confusing. Um, there's, there are a ton, if you've ever looked at, uh, out there in terms of this webinar providers or software, there are a ton of them out there. So I'll give you a little bit of hints and thoughts about how you might select those. Um, marketing your webinar, which most of you will, um, I have just one slide on that because uh, that's your expertise. Um, and then um, actually from moving, moving from single webinars to virtual events. We had to do this last year and it was um, in part economic and uh, and I'll explain that again too of, of what forced us to go there and it actually was quite a good result. Um, by trade, I grew up for about 15 years in the market research and consulting business and I spent a few years at donor advertising. Um, and um, so what, so I of course am always curious about the audience and the customer. The customer is kind of where my natural blinders go. Um, so 
one of the first things I'd like to understand about you all is how many in this room have not, have never attended a webinar? This is where you click in, give a, a few have never attended a webinar, okay. For the rest of you that have attended a webinar, how many of you have actually broadcasted a, a webinar? You've got the person presenting, right, so a few. All right, so you are the folks that will keep me honest. So, so we're kind of, um, we seem to have about a medium experience, and um, I will speak to that. So why do we webcast? And again, I, get, I do this in terms of um, having you think about whether it makes sense for you or, or not. Because a lot of us, said, you know, myself included, we, we want to adopt the, late, the latest technology just because it's there. Um, um, for webinars, I think there's, you know, there's good reasons to do it and some good reasons not. We are a web product. Um, sitting within U of M, we're a center that our product is our, our basically our web page. You go to our web page and you download something, and um, that's what we deliver to you. So we have within this web pod, product over 65,000 pieces that you can select from. Um, for those of you that are, have worked with a market research firm and have had a piece of data delivered to you, you know, columns and rows and variables and such, you, quantitative data, anyone who worked with quantitative data before? So what we supply is we supply a data set to um, a student, to a research scientist, and they can go in and analyze it further. That data set might be about uh, criminal behavior. It might be data about uh, aging. Um, it might be data about aging and their criminal behavior. Um, it happens. Um, and it might be a, a simple news poll, whether it's about um, elections um, or uh, you know something going on, some kind of current event. And so that's what we, we supply. So you go in there and you have to sort through over 65,000 data sets in order to find what you need, um, download it, and then start working with it. And you might be writing a thesis or paper, you might be using it to apply for a grant and, and you know, have some data support for that. Um, and so as you can imagine, it's, it was set up like a library, but it's often very hard to find within that 65,000 pieces what it, what it is exactly that you want to, um, what, that you want to analyze. And so we put, of course, a lot of uh, tools and things around that, but you need to understand how to use those tools as well. So the first thing about our audience, our customers, are that they are computer literate. They, um, they have computers, they work with computers, they're on them. Um, so that's kind of our first should we webcast uh, check. Um, as I mentioned, our tools are oftentimes difficult, challenging to use, so um, we could use an educational opportunity oftentimes. And the other thing is, uh, you know, going back to the, the, the old days of being at the ad agency, is we don't have a whole lot of opportunity to interact with, um, with our customers and create a band, brand identity or a personality. Our personality is a website. So actually webinars feed into that a little bit. At least we can get a voice or a friendly person uh, um, behind us. And um, the last point is that we have no real money for that marketing thing. So uh, after 15, you know, I started at, uh, in my position at, after about 15 years in the industry, and it was the first time that I went and people called it that marketing thing. There's this hand wave that goes with it. So, but we, you know, we don't uh, we don't have big budgets to uh, buy for the, the Super Bowl or anything like that. It's you know, pretty. Uh, Low, low, uh, low key. Uh, looking for a lot of effective, low cost ways to get out there. So we do webcasts, and um, you know, should you is a question. If you have tools, if you have a product that will benefit by educating your audience, um, I would say yes. It's great for lead generation. If you want to tease people with some information um, and, and, and create a the personality as well as credibility, um, that's a good thing. If you want to collaborate, you can use webinars. Um, if you are working in entities that have people in different locations and you want to collaborate, you can even write a paper together, um, design things together. Why you would want to write a paper by committee, I don't know. But if you want to do it, you can do that. Um, I would say uh, that hardcore sales are not the way to go with webinars or webcasts. Um, you, and, and we'll talk a little bit about what that content will be in a minute. 
But um, if you think you're going to do a webinar and close the deal, you know, I think that there are very few opportunities to do that. You need to think about, about more as an introduction, uh, an interactive introduction, um, again, the lead generation, educating, creating credibility. Sales, I would leave for a different avenue. Like the pub over there with the graver. Um, <clears throat> another thing you should think about is can your customers or the audience handle it? Uh, are they reachable electronically? Um, doing webinars for, um, for uh, technicians and people that are out in the field that don't have access and shouldn't be actually looking at their computers, they should be out fixing my phones, which have been down now for a week. Um, <laughs> yeah, you must be from Chelsea, right? So, um, uh, they, you know, th this isn't the group that you're going to reach real effectively unless it's something at, in, the, in the evening. Um, uh, do, and do their computer, think about their computers. This is a situation that, uh, are they equipped with speakers and microphones? They don't necessarily have to have microphones. Most of them you're just speaking at them, but can they do it? We found that a lot of our people, they logged into the webinar and they found out, oh, I don't have sound on my computer. Um, and then also, are they in offices or open air cubicles? Um, the reason I know that these are barriers is because people emailed us and yelled at us. You know, I can't, I want to attend your webinar, but I can't because I'm sitting in an open air office and everyone's going to listen and hear to it. And uh, you know, we suggest you can get some headsets, things like that. But, um, but again, um, think about your audience and your ability to consume a webinar. Um, the other thing, and you know, we've all been there, right? Um, is can your presenters handle it? Webinars, they need to be engaging. They need to keep people's attention. There are ways to make them interactive by polling and doing things like that. Um, having someone go on and on and lecture and meander without points. Um, if their babble index is high, and the majority of presenters have high babble indexes, maybe not the greatest, greatest uh, avenue or venue for you. Um, are the presenters, I would say, technologically endowed or at least not intimidated? Do, go, uh, webinar technology, broadcast intelligence, is really quite simple. It can operate in the background, but if people are uh, uh, clicky clicks, if people are clicking all around, they can do bad things. If um, if they are very, uh, if they're very intimidated, um, there's nothing worse than watching a webinar and you can see the mouse thing shaking. <laughs> so um, you can get over, you can get them over that. Do a little bit of training with them, um, and then think about your presenters. The, I, I say located on site, off site, or both, and it was just a reminder that um, actually that doesn't matter so much. Um, we're doing a virtual event in two weeks. I'm catching in people for one of the panel sessions from the Netherlands, Germany, and LA. So um, they can be all over the place. Again, as long as, um, as, long as they don't battle too much and they're not clicking clicks or they, they shake, you'll, you'll be in good shape. And as for presentation format, um, I, I said, can you handle it? Um, you have to remember, and I, since most of you have attended webinars before, how many of you clicked into a webinar thinking you were going to learn something? And um, then went, ugh, this isn't what I wanted, and then clicked out pretty quick. Yeah. How many would say uh, about half of those that you enter, you just leave before the end? Yeah. So, um, so there's, some, there's some bad stuff going on. And you need to remember, there is, a, there is a low barrier to exit. All you do is you hit that red X in the corner and you're gone. It is a passive type of, uh, of interaction for the most part. People are listening to you while they're doing other things. It's interrupted. I go up to the computer to pick up papers, the phone rings, I pick it up, I'm answering email. This is like trying an advertiser, trying to keep your attention and get a message across when you're cooking dinner, getting the kids lunches, and, and, some, and the phone is ringing. This is the same thing that's going on. And so um, think when you design your content for webinars, it's got to be short, it's got to be concise, and um, to some extent, uh, repetitive. Um, but repetitive in an interesting and engaging way, of course. Um, and, and always remember, if they get bored, it, it, they'll turn it off. And the interesting thing about a lot of webinar technology is as you're presenting, if you turn it on, you can see the people exiting. So uh, you can see the outflow and run into the back of the room. At least here we had doors, so I had you for a little bit. Um, there also is an expectation. Oh, 
And here, here's another one, again, for those people who got in there and then left right away. Your content must, must match your, please make your content match the title of your abstract. I have gotten into so many, the, the first ones that I went into, this was a handful of years ago, or, um, it was all about um, what is search engine marketing and how to incorporate it into your, um, into your organization. Y'all, how many attended that one? Several of them. I get in there, and for the first, typically they're about an hour, in the first 45 minutes, they're telling me how important it is. So I kind of know that, that's why I'm there. What I wanted to learn is what are the tips, the big picture things I should be thinking about as I implement search engine marketing, as I name the web team, but what we need to do to have people find me. And for the first part, they're showing me charts, and they're talking about how Google is a big thing. You know, it's one of those aha moments. Um, so if you're going to talk about implementing search engine marketing, talk about search engine marketing. You don't have to, you know, if you're a consultant in an area, you don't have to give them the whole thing. But you want to give them enough to feel like this is worth my time, and hey, I might want to follow up with this person in order to um, have them help me with my business. There is an expectation, the way webinars have grown up, there's an expectation that you will provide the slides and the recording. We have posted our slides and recordings, we try to do it as soon as we can, right after we do a webcast. Um, the vast majority of people don't watch the recording. Um, we tag our, our, our Google Analytics, so we know that they're not watching the recording. They're, but significant downloads of the slides. Um, it's not. It's okay too to have the slides out there before. We found that the slides actually bring more people in than um, people who grab them and go away. Um, so um, slides, good thing. The recordings people will ask. Um, but again, they don't necessarily download them, so if that's going to be a problem with you posting that, go with the slides and you'll be good to go. Um, we also suggest too, as in, if you use SlideShare, and when you SlideShare, that you put lots of notes in your slides, as well as links to your stuff and uh, contact information. But, um, but the expectation is that you're going to provide something for them for um, enduring your, in your talk, or even just registering. We provide our stuff even to those people who registered but didn't show up. So, on to selecting software. It is, uh, as I mentioned, there's a lot out there. Um, it used to be, uh, I think, WebEx owned most of the market, um, and, and now there, there are all kinds, ReadyTalk, uh, GoToWebinar, um, Adobe Connect, tons of them out there. And what I have you do before you even go out to look is think about your, your typical size of audience. Is it five, is it 500, is it 5,000? Because the differential in terms of what you're paying for, whether you're paying for people to be able to sit in seats and, and visit versus um, whether you're paying for something else is pretty significant. Um, some of these, WebEx, for example, they have a lot of bells and whistles. Um, as I said, the, the user support that they provide is um, top rate. They even have live polls who will um, answer users. Uh, attendee support questions or will um, you know, kind of help you. It's almost like having a, a concierge, if you will. Um, the thing you need to think about is what will the majority of your webinars be? Are you just sharing, edu uh, sharing information or educating people? Or do you need people, given them the ability to break out, to monitor people, to collaborate? Because they're, they're very different, different uh, technologies that will give you a lot of different uh, capabilities. Um, uh, telephone and voice over internet requirements. Um, uh, some of the suppliers, they just uh, do telephone, some just do internet, some do both. And uh, again, think about your audience, what they're going to require when they come in. Recording and archiving needs. Uh, software provider, or the providers, they will record your stuff for you and store it somewhere in their cloud that you can access, or um, you might you do, uh, record yourself and store it on your own servers and such. Um, and do you need streaming? Do you, um, do you really want, and think about this, do you really want to stream your picture or the picture of your presenters to um, hundreds of people out there? Okay, I'm just asking, just saying, think about whether that's a good thing or not. Uh, moreover, is um, having attended some webinars that had that streaming video, depending on how many people are present at that, depends on how closely the mouth moving. Uh, matches what what you're hearing. 
So the technology is getting better, but it's still not the greatest. And for me, if, if people offer their webcam, I turn it off because I'm one of those people that can't stand and not have the mouth moving at the same uh, at the, with the same audio. Um, another thing. Be sure that you take a look at whether that software requires a download. Um, so um, some of the providers, the, the attendee, you, you as a broadcaster will have to download something. But do you want to require your attendees to download something? We can't do that. Our users, a lot of them, because they're in libraries, they're working on lab things, they cannot download anything to their lab tabs. They don't have administrative rights. Um, I don't have administrative rights. I need to get my, uh, my IT folks down to download the software so, so that I can broadcast. So, um, and that's, um, if, if you're broadcasting out to businesses where they're not just entrepreneurs or self-employed, um, the chances are that they probably won't have full administrative control. And they won't find that out until two minutes before you're ready to broadcast. And they will yell at you. Um, most of the software providers provide reports on who's attending or who signed up. They will also offer um, the ability to follow up, do follow up reports to see who's paying attention, which again might be leads as to who's really interested into it. So take a look at what the reporting pieces are. And security. Um, uh, do you, you know, is what you're saying so private that um, you want to password protect things and put it in some secure environment? Um, different providers will offer different levels of security. Ours, we want everyone to see everything. We're kind of voyeuristic in that way. And um, so we don't password protect or anything like that. But I'd also say that um, it, it's whatever you're showing is uh, so uh, confidential and what have you. I, I don't know that I do the webinar thing. A few years ago, we were um, doing some design uh, um, types of, uh, we're, we're trying to do online interviews with, with a vast amount of people across the country, and so of course, the client wanted us to um, um, do something online because we couldn't afford to go to a gazillion um, cities to test these things. And um, they didn't realize we were until days before the launch, because we said, you know, we can't guarantee that people aren't going to see your new designs. And, um, and so we get to the point, we're just about to launch and you know, we made it so we could do the print screen and such to print up the designs. And um, they said, well, wait a minute. You know, we realized people could take pictures of this. We cannot guarantee that uh, these will not get out. And um, they wanted us to somehow make it so if people took a picture of their computer screen, that it was fuzzy. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those, you know how you all have moments of awe? It was a, a moment of awe. So. So anyway, we had to do a in-person, a lot of in-person uh, reviews or research on that. And then of course, cost. Um, remember, I don't have a lot of money for that marketing thing. Um, they range from all levels to affordable to, wow, I can't believe people pay that much. So um, we chose a software technology called GoToWebinar. It doesn't, the primary reason is it did not, does not require any kind of downloading for attendees, and the cost was low. So we're grandfathered in. I think we pay uh, $99 a month, and we can conduct limitless um, webinars and with a cutoff of 1,000 attendees per session. So we usually have 50 to 60. So for us, that's good. But we are, I think the prices went out, but um, um, we're, we're grandfathered in. There's still a $99 a month thing, but I think it's limited to 100 or less or something like that. So, um, The other requirements is we needed broadcasting availability by telephone and voice over internet. We knew our session size would be less than 200. The registration is easy. You click in, you put in your email and name. We might ask a few things about your organization um, and uh, your, your department title. Um, they have automated pre and post emails that you can click and say yes, send, send some information and you should include our link, of course. They have a polling capability so that I can try and make people pay attention by intermittently putting a poll and having people raise their hands and click and vote. And um, we absolutely did not want a webcam. Benefits of choosing the software. Um, and uh, our other requirements is that we wanted to be able to throw complete control over to uh, those that are presenting in the Netherlands or Germany or uh, wherever they may be. 
and uh, we wanted to record direct to our desktop. We didn't have any need to have them archive and, and save our stuff. Um, user support, um, again, we didn't, we didn't want to pay for a live host, because we, on, on, outside of our virtual events, we only do this about once, maybe twice a month. And we didn't have any breakout or spying requirements. We didn't want to watch what people are doing. Uh, we just wanted to share information with them. So GoToWebinar was right for us. Um, I would encourage you uh, to think about those questions. And then there is a great resource. Um, it's called the Top 10 Web Conferencing Software Vendors. And it is found on um, business-software.com. And um, it, it evaluates, it even has pricing. I don't know if I'm getting away with putting all that out without complaint, but um, um, great, great resource. So, okay, real quick on the marketing because you all know how to do that real well. The same marketing webinars is predominantly electronic. So, if um, you missed the um, LA2M from um, 10:13, they talked about email marketing and single supply. Um, I, we also are sure that when we send invitations, registration links, that we always include our opt-in, subscribe email list. And um, we post, of course, all of our registration links on our social media, um, where we selected Facebook and Twitter, and then we also have a quarterly e-newsletter that, uh, that uh, we put all that information in. Um, and then we try to, as much as we can, get, to get the registration links put on our professional association list and boards, so we need the trade, trade areas. Uh, if it's educational, they are quite welcoming in terms of doing that kind of thing for you. Um, scheduling, big thing, consider time zones. You really, um, one o'clock is about the best if you're trying to get west and east coast. Um, frequency is good. I would say run a monthly series and don't be afraid to repeat it because people don't download the recording and there are a lot of people churning in and churning out, so don't be afraid to re repeat your, um, your content once in a while. Reminder to attend emails. I would start, you can remind people to attend every day before for two weeks if you want. You can program it, I'd say one day before, hey, you have the webinars tomorrow, and then an hour before. And the hour before, I like because people um, lose, the, lose their confirmation email like you wouldn't believe. And um, follow up emails again, that's, that's a good time to say, here's the link to the slides. And if you have any questions, uh, um, we're here for you, as well as uh, here's our opt-in email, our subscriber list. And then, as, as any good researcher would do, take time to review who came, who didn't. And then, move on to the, um, are they working? So for us, um, we, have, we have two kind of customer levels. We have the librarians who are, um, um, they really kind of manage and maintain the subscription. We know, however, that our people that make the decisions and push actually subscribing to us are the faculty and scientists. When we started doing webinars, we started seeing the decision makers show up. So, you know, that's an automatic, automatic, automatic home run for us. We're seeing these registration announcements is, um, announcements show up. You know, I do a Google search and I can see that people have posted them on their on their blogs and things. Um, and because we include our opt-in email list, that we're seeing it grow steadily. So we know people are watching them and they're saying, hey, you know, maybe I want to receive these invitations more. So we've seen that go up quite exponentially. Um, our customers have to fight in this budget environment. They have to fight to keep our subscription, and we're um, watching them use the webinar as a training, saying they are adding value to our campus community, so let's keep this subscription. And um, we have been quite concerned, of course, as everyone is, about whether we were going to lose subscriptions. And um, actually, we've had steady to just a little bit of growth over the last two years. And so I'm going to quickly go through um, webinars to virtual conferences. We got there by um, economic disaster, which is how all good things happen, right? Um, every other year, we host an on-site meeting of about 125 people. We bring them to campus, and um, last fall in 2009, we realized that we were going to spend $85,000, $90,000, and this would probably be what we were presenting to. Um, so historically, in the 80s, and 90s, we just canceled the conference and said, well, we'll see you hopefully in, in another two years. So last year, I thought, well, why not go virtual? Let's see what happens. It's really um, not much to lose. So what happened was um, 
In 2009, as we looked at our statistics, we ended up with 227 people attending. Our typical attendance, uh, at least in 07, was uh, 115 or around 100. So we got more people in. Our show rate was 70%. Um, typically, um, stats may be changing now, but they used to tell you 50% of your people show up, you're doing well, so don't take it personally if the other 50 don't get there. Um, the, the, only, the major problem was we typically had about 11% of our folks on campus from international, not North American. We had virtually no one. We had folks in Canada, so um, North American, but no one else. And the majority of, the vast majority of attendees said it was worthwhile, they'd attend again and over half wouldn't have been able to, to um, come on site for us. Um, so um, all in all, it was a good thing. As I mentioned, our download of slides was robust, recordings, not so much. So some pointers. Um, you'll need to create a virtual meeting page. Um, I emphasize simplicity. Um, just first of all, that page that explains what it is and who should attend, otherwise you'll get questions. Um, then a sessions and presentations that has the links to the um, links to the registration, as well as I put the slides out there as soon as I get them. A meeting and evaluation is always good. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about a help desk. The other optional thing is we had a meeting registration page. We use that opportunity to have people come in um, and uh, register with their mailing address, and then we send them some uh, headsets so they can listen and speak with a mic, $3.25, they work wonderfully. Um, and um, then we also send them other trinkets and trash and brochures and such. And then we also last year had a big discussion and networking opportunities. We put blog boards up there and such. This year we're just restricting it to Twitter using a hashtag. So, because um, uh, not many people participated. So this is our site. This is that first page. What is it? This is the sessions and presentations page. It has the link, the time, the date, and what it's about, presenters, and that's where you also find your slides. And then the meeting feedback, um, and again, we use a very low maintenance uh, survey monkey to do ours, because uh, they give us all that we need. We do, I would highly recommend a help desk, and really all, if you, um, all you really need to do there is point to the software provider's help documentation. Don't bother doing it yourself. Anything you're using, just put their help documentation there. Also clear what, state what you can and cannot help with. I mean, there were people that were calling us wanting to solve their IT problems that they've been dealing with for 10 years. And, you know, we can't do that. Um, so we did develop a short list of FAQs, um, people who couldn't launch this launch things or doing different information emails, we know that it likely was spam filters. Again, we can't we can make that not happen, but we can at least have you go yell at your IT people. Um, and we did we do have live help available. Just um, we have people on the on our uh, email, on the telephone, and then also we have live chat. Um, nobody used live chat. They called. So uh, and uh, and just you know, don't take it personally. People will yell at you for their messed up IT system. So, um, um, and some of them, even when they get it solved, you should have known that I'm using something from 1994. <laughs> and if you, if federal government is a primary customer, strangely enough, um, there are places like the CIA and stuff that can get out to go to webinar, and then there are places like the Library of Congress who they can't go to go to webinar because it's on the spam list. And um, so when they click on the link, it says unauthorized. So be careful. Um, some of the government folks understood that that's beyond our control. Some of them yelled at us because we should have um, applied nine months in advance to get it open for the day of this conference. Um, again, not something, they're, um, we're a significant customer, but not something, uh, they also have approved vendors, and the proof vendors they had were very high end, very high cost, and we just can't do that. Unfortunately, you know, I love to please every customer, but then there's some that we just, because of the cost benefit, primarily the cost, we can't do. So I just, you know, helping, this is, we have a one page help desk piece. Um, you can go to our site and um, actually see what it's all about. Really straightforward, feel free to copy anything you'd like. Um, when you're putting a meeting together, I always say practice disaster. Practice the presenters doing really wacky things, play with that software and learn how to recover it. Um, registration easy, um, make sure somebody's moderating, moderating each session in case somebody turns off their, their audio. Um, and then we talked again. 
adhere to the time constraints um, and post those recording in slides. And of course, things that you all know about uh, using social media. If you have money for your virtual event, I'm going to show you something really cool. There are a growing list of software or technology vendors. In Expo is one that I've seen a lot of, and for the American Marketing Association uses it. Um, they have the neatest thing. I would, um, it's a lot like Second Life, but you don't have to learn anything. You just upload your fo photo, and you don't have to learn to walk. This one, we were investing in Second Life some time ago, and the guy, one of the gentlemen said, you know, I kept sitting on this person's lap. I didn't know who she was, and then um, went to Second Life jail, you know. So um, this is no learning curve at all. It feels like it, but it's um, like a Second Life, but it is not Second Life. So this is what money will buy you. Um, Exhibit hall, auditorium, and such. Now I get virtual event envy looking at this, but um, I haven't even approached looking at the cost because I'm quite sure it's out of our uh, out of our league. This is their auditorium. You can click in. You um, they have help. They have people talking to you as you come into the auditorium. Probably can't make it up here, but that bottom it looks like seats in the auditorium. And when you actually talk, uh, go into the talk, you put the slides, and then you can click back and forth to read the gentleman's abstract, his bio, and then the questions that are coming in. Um, they also have live feeds of Twitter coming in so that you can see what's being said about it. And they have a conference hall, or even an exhibit hall. So you can walk along as you would in a normal exhibit hall. And when you click on one of the vendors, it opens up and there's an avatar there. Um, you can see you're in this little thing, they can look at you and they'll say, hi, Linda, how are you doing? What, anything you'd like to learn today? And you no, leave me alone, give me my, my pen, my virtual pen. Um, and in a, in a way that they normally encourage people to go to these exhibit halls, of course, is that uh, you can go and if you download their stuff, you get points to be put into a, um, into a drawing. And at the end, somebody, will, if they have a lot of points, will get drawing. Or they, you can enter into their own contests. So as close as you can get. So broadcast and they will come. And uh, I think I've gone over in my chat. Apologies for that. But if you have any questions, I am happy to answer them. Linda, thank you very much. A round of applause for you today. And we have time to take questions. So Linda, I'd like to give you back the mic. And as people raise their hand, go around with the mic and now uh, for some. Sure. Oh, yes, good question. Who wants to back first? Okay. I was wondering if you could tell us again that uh, site, uh, business-software.com, and uh, it was the top 10 web conferencing. I didn't quite get that. You're asking me to have a memory. Let me put it up. <laughs> and while I'm putting it up, why don't you go ahead? Two questions. One, first, can we get a copy of these slides? That, that, um, what, I, I do a fair number of webinars, and, and I have a really hard time with not having that ability to have um, feedback from watching people. Are they reacting well? And I use the, you know, put your hand up if you understand. Put your hand up this, and, I, and you can only do so many polls and things. Any other techniques you found that sort of give you that? Touching. Sometimes we let them talk, you know, if, if it's not too many. Anything else you can suggest? Well, I do this um, presentation as much as I can because it's a lot of fun. It's called um, Engaging Your Audience. And um, it's a little, a little tougher than on uh, webinars, of course. It, you know, for me, engaging them is a I, I spent a number of years in an ad agency, and of course, visuals, lots of visuals, and not dry I think pretty dry stuff here, but um, anytime you can use visuals, I was saying of children, but <laughs> children and their pets. Um, but even stuff like that, it, it, as long as they make sense, so one thing is imagery, because um, people will stop and look, or, um, um, you know, a lot of people here you know, still like sliding uh, th pictures of their kids and such, and um, I, I can do that for you today, I'm sorry. Maybe if I'm invited back, but, um, um, but I think it's the same thing as that. The other thing I love is um, any time I can, I incorporate video. Now, video into webinars, some of them can handle it. It's still very difficult because the way webinar technology works is they put everybody into a booth. 
and you have this headset on. And so actually the computer sound is, is you. It's not the computer. So um, I love to use Pure Michigan amps for obvious reasons. Because um, people look at that and go, oh my gosh, you know. Um, so you have to do tricks like um, you, you have to pull out your sound from your ears and put the mic up to that sound to get it going. But it, it's kind of things like that it's to get people engaged so that they're afraid not to watch because they might miss something. It's just, it's a lot like advertising. But indeed, the polling, the polling is great because people like to participate and click on things. I don't make them super formal. Um, you can do a formal presentation and have fun stuff. And um, um, in, in the academic world, people are starting to get a little more, more comfortable with that. I think because they're letting people like me in. And um, you know, it's uh, because I, I do tell people that for me, uh, presentations, even if I'm delivering a research report and it's bad news, I still try and make them engaging. So, um, and you can do that, you know, with virtually any topic. And to answer um, the question about the slides, um, we post the slide presentations on the la2m.org site. If you go to the events page and then to the archive section, you can get a copy of Linda's slides there. Do we have other questions for Linda? And it's a top 10 copy software that you can Yeah, yeah, I do. Thank you. Yeah. Well, Linda, do you charge for webinars? How do you decide? Ooh, good question. Another pet peeve list. Um, we don't charge. Our whole idea or our whole goal with webinars is to get people to know us. Um, they don't even have to get to know the acronym, but just to get to people so they can search for us and find us. <laughs> So um, there are a number, although I think that it's failing, because I was getting, probably you all were, a bunch of webinars where it was $150 to attend. The problem is, is that we are so conditioned that we go in, we sample it, and then go away if it's not right. And so many, so much of the webinars are not quite right yet. So I'm not gonna you know, spend $150 or $149 to, um, to sample it. I'm not willing to spend $50 to do that. If you are delivering something that's a training element that's, uh, that you're going to restrict people and such, um, you can attempt it, but make darn sure that your title and what you're going to deliver delivers. Or um, I can imagine the anger for people um, it, it, spending $50, spending $10 even, um, and not getting what they want. And, uh, and, and again, there's just a danger factor with me because I've had so many bad experiences. Um, um, so, so yeah, I, I don't think we'll ever charge. I'd love to. I, I love new revenue streams, but I don't think that'll ever be in our, in our world. Hi. Um, do, do you uh, do interactive, almost like uh, conferences, where you're encouraging the feedback and the dialogue, or is it mostly just one way outbound? And what's your experience with that interactive, highly interactive? Um, so, we try to do interactive. Um, in our virtual event, we attempted, we set up bulletin boards. I had, we had four different topic areas. I had people, staff, posting questions and ready to answer the question, and we got nothing. Um, so um, we, we did some tweeting. Uh, this was in 2009. We did some tweeting, we did some Facebook thing, and we got people interacting a little bit that way. Um, mostly we're pushing information out. Um, we're gonna, you know, so we're sampling a little bit. So now we're just we're using the hashtag on, in that first week of November or second week of November um, called Data Fair, and we're going to see what happens. The marketing AMA community they do the hashtag stuff out, and then the the interactive interactivity is huge. Now these are marketers, you know. I like to think that we're all engaging, right? You know, I'm I'm working with a different type of audience. It's librarians, it's social scientists, and um, they're. Although the librarian community is, is, can be very engaging, the others are not maybe so much to do that. So we're, we're doing a test. Um, again, AMA does a great job, and um, it works for them. Us, we're still trying to figure out what, what works for us. Thank you. I was wondering what kind of microphone you found to do that. Okay. Uh, so, um, we went out and bought, uh, for the virtual 
conference. We went out and bought um, $99, and I think there was one, four or five, four of those, and then we bought a higher end one. And um, what I brought a cast with is a $3.25 headset. And I, I don't know if it's Logitech or whatever it is. I use the headsets that we got to send out for trinkets and trash because the higher end ones are largely driven by putting them into that, that little port and they're wireless. And for whatever reason, they would go in and out um, just a, on, on the drop of a hat. We never knew when they were going to be in or when they were going to be out. That's not something that you want to chance. They worked 75% of the time, the high ones. You really need it to work 100% of the time. And the quality of the audio was no different whether it was $99 or $3.25. So you can do it. I encourage you to do it with the cheap, you know, as long as they plug in, they have two plugs, one for mic, one for ear. That works 100% of the time. Was that like Radio Shack stuff? Or? Um, it may have been a Logitech, a low-end Logitech or something. Um, uh, you know, um, I know the high-end ones were, were Logitech. And again, they were nice because you could walk around the room and talk. but. Uh, better to be connected and work. And we have one more question here. Uh, a lot of the webinars that I've seen is, is just going through the PowerPoint slides of somebody talking. I'm curious to know with streaming video technology, if there's a way to flip between physically presenting and actually being able to see the presenter and showing, flipping between the slides, or maybe from showing them the same <coughs> There is technology out there. Um, uh, when, we, when we did a one of the things we want to do is make our business presentation, kind of our annual report, um, um, nice and savvy. And so there is good technology out there where you can have the presenter um, speaking and coinciding with slides and such. Um, it, it's, it's still very tough when you're doing it live. And that was taped and then we, we presented it kind of live streaming and such. The go-to, the webinar software that we're using, you can do any, anything you can do on your computer, you can show people. So um, if you, you know, want to show you a picture, I think the way people have done it with ours is they actually webcam themselves onto their screen and then did their slides in the corner. And then they just use the webinar technology to broadcast that out to people. You have to be really, real careful what's going to happen with the audio. I, I'm presuming that the gentleman had a mic like this versus a mic that was right up across his mouth because whenever I want to do video, I have to unplug my mic and um, stick the mic right up against the, the Pure Michigan ad or whatever it might be in the video. So you just have to be careful what kind of video options you have. But you can do virtually anything. Um, it's uh, just whether you have to trick with the technology. Um, I probably, you probably got from me, I don't want anyone doing the video cam thing. I can do it in my pajamas. Not that I do. <laughs> I guess the other invitation is, if you haven't experienced a virtual event, American Marketing Association has a lot of them. I'm sure a lot of you are members. You don't, there's no commitment. You just go in and you register. They have it, they use, right now they're using InExpo. Um, and then you're welcome if you want to take a look at what we're doing. It's November 8th through the 11th. If you go to our website, um, you can use ICPSR or ICSPR and Google Analytics will get you there. Go to the website, search on it, and search for data fair, and then go to sessions. And, um, it doesn't, it won't take up seats or anything if you want to just experience it for a while. I won't be broadcasting, but, uh, but uh, so that's probably a good thing. Linda, thank you so much for all of the information, all of the tips, and great answers to some really good questions. Um, a round of applause for Linda. <laughs> now is the portion of Lunch and Agro Marketing where we pass the mic. Please stand up, introduce yourself, your business, or opportunities that you're looking for, and we'll start with Liz. Thanks, Dean. Liz Cizak from Cizak Creative Resources. I'm a writer. I work with graphic designers to produce marketing pieces. I do a lot of work for healthcare systems, universities, and professional service groups. Well, this wasn't planned, but... <laughs> Uh, Jane Delancey with Delancey Design, and I'm a graphic designer, um, and I'm a writer. Um, and you know, design touches so many things that, you know, we design websites, visual displays, you know, t-shirts, uh, almost any car, good car, vehicle graphics. Uh, but today I just wanted to mention that we do do displays. Uh, this could be a trade show booth from the ground up. 
for just a simple freestanding display. Jane Delancey, Delancey Design, DelanceyDesign.com. Greetings, I'm Dave Owens. I'm with Logic Solutions here in Ann Arbor, and we're doing a lot of web development work. Uh, the hottest thing we have going on now are mobile apps, iPad apps, and uh, I've got a few of them here with me. Thank you. Hello, I'm Sherry Marcy, your ambassador from GLEQ, Great Lakes Entrepreneurs Quest, which is www.gleq.org. Uh, we're in the middle of our contest, uh, business plan contest, and we're looking for mentors. So if you work with companies, small companies, startup companies, whatever, and you might like to volunteer, go to the website and uh, volunteer as a mentor. It's a great way to get started in, in your side of the business. www.gleq.org. Um, hi, I'm Jean Lieberman. Uh, my company is Personalized Productions. Uh, we focus a lot on project management and tools, in particular Microsoft Project. Uh, we're doing a training thing in Ann Arbor on cost management with Microsoft Project November 6th. We could end up doing it as a webinar. We, we may do it face. We do a lot of those sort of go-between, so try really hard to make them engaging and interesting and whatever. But my website is personalizedproductions.com. And Mike, want to say the training. Gee, do we have dinner on Sunday? What? At Vivian's? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, I think it was just, uh, uh, Mike Wynn with Sandra Trading. Uh, we work with entrepreneurs, owners of small businesses who are frustrated with their sales results. Uh, www.sandlerannarbor.com. Hi, I'm Carol Lesher. I'm with Ozone House. I dropped off some cards at the table. Today we're asking each of you to go back to your computer and go to Art Band Charity Challenge. We have a chance to win $25,000 for homeless and at-risk youth here in Washington County. Please help us. Thank you. Hi, I'm Stacy from Dollar Bill. We're a local digital print firm, and we love to help nonprofits look good, cost little. Thanks. I guess I got a lot to talk. I'm Mark Robinson uh, from the William Davis Institute, which is a uh, private institute attached to the business school. We help the business school professors develop teaching materials. So I'm going to introduce Sandy Graham, who's our marketing director, and Nolima uh, Ashwald, who's one of our business case writers. And we're not selling anything to anybody, at least here right now. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Kurt Williams from KW uh, Works. We do web design and web development. Uh, create new websites, but do a lot of custom software development, particularly on the .NET kind of, kind of the .NET shop. So if you have or know of anybody who has need of custom software development in the Microsoft family of technologies, give us a ring. Kirk Williams from KW Works. Hi, I'm Bob Shannon. I'm a CPA with my own CPA firm. Uh, I'm in the Chelsea area, but I handle everything within Washington, all Lenawee County. I help entrepreneurs, small companies get off the ground, get your QuickBooks set up or whatever your general ledger is, your taxes, and generally try and uh, do as much of your work and free you up to do what you like to do, which is grow the business. Again, Robert D. E. Shannon, CPA. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Rich Austin. I work with uh, Mike Wynn over at Sandler Train. And uh, like he mentioned, we work with entrepreneurs and business owners who uh, typically come to us because they're frustrated that there's a gap between where they are and where they envision that they'd be. And so um, we help them close that gap. Hi, I'm Molly Dargan. I'm an intern at Ingenix Digital Marketing, and I'm a senior at Michigan State. Hi, I'm Jacob Smith. This is Adam Duke. We're with Go Green Energy Consulting. We do home energy inspections and uh, follow-up upgrades. Uh, we want to let everybody know that there is a 30% federal energy efficiency tax credit that expires at the end of the year. That's up to $1,500. If you have not taken advantage, if any of your friends have not taken advantage, that's just free money back from the government. So you should call us and uh, visit our website, www.gogreenec.com. 
Hi, Amy Pichera with Think Stretch. We are a summer learning program designed to include the entire school or your entire program learning workbook. So if you have children or know of schools that would be interested, go to our website, thinkstretch.com. Um, I'm Kyle Stoof, I'm with Ann Arbor Radio, uh, we're Ann Arbor's 1071, uh, W4 Country, which is 102.9, uh, Sports Top 1050, which does all the U of M sports, and Business Top 1290 with uh, everybody's friend in the so, um, We're having a one day sale coming up, we do it every fourth quarter. If you're thinking about doing radio, if you have questions about doing radio, uh, this is the time to start. Uh, our friend Ross from 3.7 Designs, we started his uh, campaign through the one day sale last year. It's a good introduction to the market. Got them in there. That's coming out. They don't let us know until a couple days before. So uh, I can tell you a little bit about it. So come see me. I'm Kyle with the Radio. Hi, I'm Bob Fran, and I do advertising photography. The name of my company is Bob Fran Photography. And you can see my work at bobfranphoto.com. Photographers again. I'm Carter Sherlock from Print Studios, and I'm a commercial editorial and portrait photographer, which pretty much means everything except for weddings. I'm Roger Rail. Um, lately, I've been doing a lot of um, event uh, uh, planning and recording and video casting. Uh, I also do a lot of with Google Earth mashups and help startups with all their uh, information needs. And uh, anybody going to the Ghoul Walk uh, Friday night? Uh, the, there's a, the, apparently the Ghoul Walk from uh, the Die to Vault of Midnight. Um, and it's a fundraiser. You bring uh, non perishable food in, it's to help uh, people that need food. <laughs> so there'd be ghouls walking around. <laughs> I am Dee Davey, Creative Ideas Marketing. I'm an independent marketing contractor and I help overstretched and under-resourced marketing teams get projects off their desk without the investment of a full-time resource. I also help product development teams um, create and launch new service products for generating revenue. And it's my pleasure to close this meeting out, but before doing so, to thank Linda again for joining us and to announce next week's speaker. Next week we have Brandon Chestnut, and Brandon is going to be talking about using segmentation, but within the digital space, using segmentation in your digital marketing and social marketing. So join us next week at Lunch Ann Arbor Marketing. Have a great day. Thank you.